Let me begin again. Assalamu alaikum. Praise belongs to Allah and we praise him and we ask him for guidance and forgiveness. And we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom he makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God as is his due and make sure you devote yourselves to him until your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. All right, we're good on volume. Again, assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. I am grateful to Allah that we are sharing company again on this blessed Friday. The last time um, that I joined you from this end of the screen was back in November. And I truly hope that the next time uh, that I gave a Friday reflection, it would be under much different circumstances, much more positive circumstances. And unfortunately for our siblings in Palestine, um, they are still enduring what can only be described as hell on earth. The pictures and videos coming out of Gaza are absolutely unbearable and no human being in the 21st century should be living and dying like this. And I know that you share the dismay and disbelief that what we are witnessing is a genocide funded in part by our own dollars. How hopeless do we all feel that we cannot stop it? You know, I'm reminded of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in which he tells us in an authentic hadith that whosoever of you sees evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he or she is not able to do to do so, then, then change it with your tongue. And if he or she is not able to do so, then change it with your heart. And that is, a, is the weakest of faith. And I feel like I've heard this hadith more in the past few months than I have in the past few years. And yet, I will admit, I have to push myself to find comfort in it. I try to humble myself by remembering that there is wisdom in those words that I may never comprehend. And I remind myself that everything in our world is from Allah. The blessings, the livelihood, joy, security, safety are all from Allah. And also the suffering is from Allah. And that there is reward in all of that. And of course, we may not be able to fix an injustice that we see in front of us. It was the same for the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, during the early years of Islam. When the Muslims were weak and oppressed and could do very, um, could could not do very well, could not stop the injustices against them, and in that difficult time, the Messenger of Allah would console the oppressed and remind them of their reward. As an example, when he passed by Yasser and Sumayya and their son Ammar being tortured by Abu Jahl, he said, "Patience, O family of Yasser, for verily your appointed place is in paradise." And so I ask Allah to grant the same reward to those suffering and dying in Palestine and those all over the world that face torture and death at the hand of an oppressor. I mean, another thing that I've heard uh, numerous times over the past few months is sort of this comparison of these, you know, the modern day oppressors to that of the Pharaoh of Egypt, the oppressor of Moses, peace and blessings be upon him and the Israelites. And I get that. It is very easy when you're reading the news or history books to see that resemblance. So, uh, of course, that is why the story of Moses and Pharaoh are not just in the Quran, but also in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Allah placed those stories in our books as a reminder and guidance for us all. What I don't want to do is focus too much on proving the comparison to Pharaoh, um, you know, to today, and that, that we forget the power of Moses, peace and blessings be upon him and miss what the story teaches us. And so I'd like to use this time to reflect on that story of Moses, the prophet of God, who is mentioned more times in the Quran than any other person. And I'd like all of us to reflect on his story in the hopes that we can gain some perspective and ease our minds and put peace in our hearts, even if it's just for a little while. I know the mental anguish that many of us are living in has taken a toll. It damages our mind, our patience, our softness, our gentleness, our reason, and oftentimes our body. It affects us in ways most people cannot understand. We are all enduring some form of trauma right now. And maybe as a collective group, we can process, sojourn, and heal ourselves, God willing, inshallah. 
So we will begin the story of Moses. And of course, we cannot cover his whole life today, just the very beginning. But maybe we can continue the story next time I'm fortunate enough to join you. And so just to note, I'm sourcing this from like a 12 part story that was published in 2010. I know most, if not all of you are very familiar with the story of Moses, but I'm taking a page from Brother Amr's book and using this opportunity to pretend I'm speaking to my children in the hopes that they will gain an understanding of this story and a relevance, a relevance uh, to today. And so I ask you to do this. As I read the story of Moses, I want you to picture that this has taken place uh, in current Gaza. So we know that the, the Quran is a book of guidance for all humankind. It's not a history book, but it does contain historical information. And God asks us to reflect and contemplate on the stories of the prophets in order that we may gain, uh, that we may learn from their trials and tribulations and triumphs. Moses' story contains many lessons for humankind. God says that the account of Moses and Pharaoh in the Quran is the truth. It is a story of political intrigue and of oppression that, that knew no bounds. And so Allah says in the Quran to the prophet, we recount to you part of the story of Moses and Pharaoh, setting out the truth for people who believe. Pharaoh made himself high and mighty in the land and divided the people into groups. One group he oppressed, slaughtering their sons and sparing their women. He was one of those who spread corruption. That is from Surah al qasas verse 3 and 4. And so Moses was born into one of the most politically charged times in history. The Pharaoh of Egypt was a dominant power figure in the land. He was so incredibly powerful that he referred to himself as a god, and nobody was inclined or able to dispute it. He said, I am your Lord, most high. That's from Surah Naziat. Pharaoh effortlessly exerted his authority and influence all over the people of Egypt. He used his strategy to divide and conquer. He set up class distinctions, divided the people into groups and tribes, and set them against one another. The Jews, the children of Israel, were put at the lowest level of Egyptian society. They were the slaves and servants. Moses' family was from amongst the children of Israel. And Egypt at the time was known as the world's superpower. The ultimate power rested in the hands of very few. Pharaoh and his trusted ministers directed matters as if lives of the population were of little or no consequence. And political situation was in some ways similar to the political world of the 21st century in a time when the young people of the world are used as cannon fodder for the political and military games of the most powerful. The story of Moses is particularly pertinent. According to Islamic scholar, scholar Ibn Kathir, the children of Israel talked vaguely about one of their nation's sons rising to wrest the throne of Egypt from Pharaoh. Perhaps it was just a persistent daydream from an oppressed people or even an ancient prophecy, but the story of Moses begins here. A yearning for freedom coupled with a tyrannical king's dream. The people of Egypt were influenced by dreams and their interpretation of dreams. Dreams featured prominently in the story of Yusuf, peace be upon him, and once again in the story of Moses. The fate of the children of Israel is affected by a dream. Pharaoh dreams that a child from the children of Israel grows to manhood and seizes his throne. True to character, Pharaoh reacts arrogantly and gives the order that all male children born to the children of Israel be killed. His ministers, however, perceived that this would lead to the complete annihilation of the children of Israel and economic ruin for Egypt. How, they asked, would the empire function without slaves and servants? The order is changed. The male children are killed one year, but spared the next. Pharaoh becomes so fanatical, he sends spies and security agents to seek out pregnant women. If any woman gives birth to a male child, he is immediately put to death. When Moses' mother becomes pregnant with a child destined to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, she conceals her pregnancy. However, God wished to do a favor to those who were weak and oppressed, and Pharaoh's plan was thwarted. In the Quran, the Surah, Surah Al-Qasas continues, And we wish to do, you, to do a favor for those who are weak and oppressed in the land, and make them rulers and make them inheritors, and to establish them in the land. And we let Pharaoh and Hamam, Egypt's chief minister, and their hosts receive from them with that which they, they feared. The scene is set, the child is born, the winds of change begin to blow and God demonstrates that humans may plan and scheme, but he alone is the best of planners. And there are lessons uh, for mankind throughout the story of Moses, which are not only learned after his prophethood, 
Rather, they are found even when he was a newborn. His righteous mother's behavior gives us numerous lessons that are relevant even today. Put your trust in God. Moses was born, of course, as we know, in a year in which the sons of Israel were, were to be put to death the moment they were born. So if we can imagine the sense of fear that permeated every aspect of life under such conditions, pregnancy was not an event to be celebrated and cherished, but a source of fear and insecurity. Security guards would roam the streets, invading homes, searching for pregnant women. Therefore, Mo Moses' mother had to conceal her pregnancy. Imagine the conditions in which she gave birth, fearful, silent, possibly shrouded in darkness. Was she surrounded by women or alone? Did her husband hold her hand, praying that she did not cry out, revealing herself to the neighbors or guards? Whatever the conditions, Moses was born a boy. His parents' heart must have been, must have been constricted with joy and fear simultaneously. What were they going to do now? How would they conceal the newborn baby? Moses' mother was a righteous woman, pious, God-fearing. Therefore, in her hour of need, she turned to God, and he inspired her next actions. And we inspired the mother of Moses, saying, Suckle him, and when you fear for him, cast him into the river, and fear not, nor grieve. Verily, we shall bring him back to you, and, we, and, and shall make him one of our messengers. Moses' mother had just spent the last months concealing her pregnancy for fear that her child would be put to death. Now she holds him to her breast. God inspires her to cast him into a river. Not a gentle stream, but the Nile River, a huge, powerful river with a strong current. Her initial, her initial reaction must have been that such an action would be condemning him to a certain death. Moses' mother put her trust in God. Do not fear and do not grieve, for we will bring him back to you. She made a waterproof basket, placed a tiny, her tiny son inside, and cast him into the river. And Ibn Kathir narrates that as the basket touched the water, the raging current became calm and gentle, sweeping the basket silently downstream. Moses' sister was instructed by her mother to slip silently through the reeds and follow the basket on its journey. The basket, with its precious cargo, courses down the Nile River, passing houses, boats, people unnoticed until it stops at Pharaoh's palace. Moses' sister watches in fear as someone from Pharaoh's household removes the basket from the river. Moses was cast into the river to escape certain death, and now he is resting in the palace of Pharaoh. This is surely too much for a mother to bear. However, events are about to unfold, are about to unfold that will demonstrate the promise of God, that the promise of God is true. So the story continues. We know that baby Moses was taken to Asia, the wife of Pharaoh. And Asia, in contrast to her arrogant, proud husband, was a righteous, merciful woman. God opened her heart and Asia looked down upon the, ba the tiny baby and felt overcome by, by her love for him. The royal couple were unable to conceive a child and this tiny baby awakened her maternal inst instincts. Asia clutched him to her chest and asked her husband to accept the child into the family. Probably against his better judgment, the Pharaoh accepted the child, who was part of God's plan to bring down the royal house. Far from abandoning him, God sent Moses up as a royal son of Egypt. He provided him with the strongest human support in the land. Asia and Pharaoh now had a son, who was now protected by the very person who had sought to kill him. So Asia summoned the wet. So we know that Asia summoned the wet nurse to the palace. Uh, but the tiny child refused to suckle. And of course, this is going to bring a huge amount of distress to Asia uh, because there were no baby formula supplements to offer to the child. So can you imagine a situation in which a baby will not nurse, but there are no other options to satiate that child's hunger? Um, And then at this stage, the royal palace was in turmoil. The women of the household were fussing over Asia and the new baby, and therefore no one noticed the presence of Moses' sister amongst the servants. She summoned all of her courage, stepped forward, offering a solution. She said she knew of a woman who would suckle the child affectionately. Why would the royal household take the advice of an unknown child if not to fulfill God's plan? Moses' sister was ordered to rush and fetch that woman. In the Quran, it says, and we have already forbidden other foster suckling mothers for him until she, his sister, came up and said, shall I direct you to a household who will rear him for you and sincerely they will look after him in a good manner? Moses' mother was in her home. Was she pacing? Was she weeping silently? We don't know, but God tells us that her heart was empty and she was about to revere, reveal herself. Was she considering dashing down the river, searching frantically through the reeds? God relieved her 
of that torment when her daughter rushed into the house, breathlessly relating the story of what happened to Moses. Mother and daughter lost no time returning to the palace. When Moses's hand, when Moses was handed to his real mother, he settled immediately and began to suckle. And again, according to Ibn Kathir, the household, including Pharaoh himself, was astonished. Pharaoh asked the woman who she was, and she replied, I am a woman of sweet milk and sweet smell, and no child refuses me. Pharaoh accepted this answer, and thus Moses was returned to the arms of his mother and raised in the palace as a prince of Egypt. Thir verse 13 of Surah al Qasas says, So did we restore him to his mother, that she might be delighted, and that she might not grieve, and that she might know the, that the promise of God is true, but most of them know not. I say this saying of mine, and I seek forgiveness from Allah, for me and for you and for the rest of Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. In the name of Allah and exalted, in the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah, the blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. So that's as far as we're going to go in the Moses story today. Um, but I hope that we can draw some connections and parallels um, to that story, the story of Moses, peace and blessings be upon him in the current situation in Gaza. The story starts out by mentioning that Pharaoh created division and classes among the people. How many times have we seen this in history? The intentional dividing of a people into, into a class distinctions. It's a tried and true way to create divisiveness. Think of the caste system in India, Jim Crow, racism right here in this country, apartheid in South Africa. It creates a social hierarchy where the bottom rungs are vying to push down one another in an effort to achieve some sort of an advancement. In Palestine, we see this implemented in many forms. For instance, in the occupied ter territories, you have residents with blue or green IDs. You have Palestinian Arabs with Israeli citizenship. Permits, which allow you to go from one place to another or from or who, that bar you from going from one place to another. Geographical zones, etc. I mean, it goes on. This hierarchy affects how you move, what you can achieve, what you can access, who you decide to marry, where you, whether you live or die. So then the story goes on saying that Pharaoh makes this edict to kill all the male children. You know, this is akin to the detention and imprisonment, imprisonment of Palestinian children. What other nation on earth uses military courts to try, not just adults, but children in land they do not have sovereignty over. And that's only when they're actually brought to trial. So often they are held indefinitely without a formal charge or hearing. And these military courts have a 99.6 conviction rate. That trauma causes so much damage, both mentally and physically, to a child. It is immeasurable. It is a modern day's version of Pharaoh's tactic, eliminating the children from society. When we hear about Moses' birth, do we think of the pregnant women in Gaza having to deliver their children in tents or in hospitals under Israeli shelling, then being forced to leave the hospital prematurely without adequate recovery or treatment? Do those women and mothers feel what the mother of Moses felt? Who are the Palestinian characters of Asia, mother of Moses, sister of Moses? You know, I'm sure you all heard of Hind Rajab, the six-year-old girl who was trapped in a car that was hit by an Israeli tank, killing the family members inside of it. She was also eventually killed, along with the medics attempting to rescue her. Her parents sent her with the family that she was traveling with in the hopes that she would be saved. Do her parents feel what Moses' parents must have felt when they sent him down the river? I learned of a, of a new word this week as I was listening to a report by Francesca Albanese, who serves as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories. She describes what we are seeing currently in Gaza with regards to the youngest victims as unchilding. This means to divest child of childhood or childlike characteristics or to, 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 bri to deprive a child of their childhood or the, or the qualities associated with it. Think about this. Tens of thousands of children are being robbed of their childhood and what it means to be a child. 
They haven't gone to school for the past 130 plus days. They're being orphaned daily, suddenly becoming the oldest member of their family and inheriting younger siblings to care for. Do they feel the empowerment of Moses' sister keeping an eye out for their younger siblings? Does Miss Albanese feel the power of Asi when she speaks of the truth despite knowing how the oppressor could react? We know Pharaoh is evil and his character is mentioned throughout the story of Moses, but Pharaoh is not the central character in this story. So far, we've been introduced to Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, his mother, his sister, Asia, wife of Pharaoh. All of these characters and many more to come in the story are far more central to the story itself than Pharaoh is. And this is what we must remember when we sit witnessing massive oppression and injustice. We must focus on the oppressed and not the oppressor, or we will never feel hope in this situation. As Muslims, we know that humans may plan and scheme, but Allah alone is the best of planners. There is good hap uh, There is good in what is happening in Gaza. We may not be able to see it right now, but we must continue to pray that Allah's plan is to bring pre peace justice and fairness to all oppressed people and that Allah gives us the clarity to trust and see that good and that Allah gives us the power to be the hand of change for these people and all people who are facing oppression not just those in Gaza I'll close this uh, reflection with uh, some dua Ola Please accept our good deeds and our good intentions and forgive us our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to experience many more moments together. O oh Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire. O oh Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenges we may face. O oh Allah, rid us of our anxiety and despair and sorrow and replace in us a sense of serenity and tranquility. O oh Allah, we ask you to place peace and solace in the hearts of those suffering any injustices. O oh Allah, we, we hope for your mercy and do not leave us to ourselves for even the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone and my gratitude goes to him. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, and that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression. Amin.